Hello and welcome back. We are going to finish up the, I think this is homily number six, so we're going to finish it up. Uh, we're on chapter 16. And basically we're just going through a big uh, discourse on paganism. And so I'm not dwelling too much on it because there's really not a whole lot to discuss about it. And, you know, I'm, I'm not really um, reading this to learn about paganism or to teach about it. I'm just kind of making a couple of comments here and there. But essentially, um, the argument is being put forth that these pagan uh, Greco-Roman beliefs, the same legends that you were taught in high school at the Government Indoctrination Center about um, all you know these uh, Greek myths, that they were just allegories for other um, bits of hidden knowledge. Okay, so Clement has basically showing Appion that he's already heard all this before, so he's going through and giving him a discourse and saying, okay, well, look, just to prove to you I've heard all of this before, <clears throat> here's the rest of the story. <clears throat> so that's what Clement's saying. He says, And Hercules, who slew the serpent which led and guarded riches, is the true philosophical reason why, which, free from all wickedness, wanders all over the world, visiting the souls of men and chastising... Um, all it meets, namely men like fierce lions or timid stags or savage boars or multiform hydras. And so, with all the other fabled labors of Hercules, they all have a hidden reference to moral valor. But these instances much must suffice, for all our time would be insu insufficient if we were to go over each one. Now, since these things can clearly, profitably, and without prejudice to piety set forth in an open and straightforward manner, I wonder why you call these men sensible and wise who concealed them under crooked riddles and overlaid them with filthy stories and thus, as if impelled by an evil spirit, deceived almost all men. For either these things are not riddles but real crimes of gods or in which uh, case they should not have been exposed to contempt, uh, nor should the nor should these their needs have been set forth before men at all as models or things falsely attributed to the gods were set forth in an allegory. And then Appion, they whom you call wise, erred in that by concealing them under unworthy stories, things in themselves worthy, they led men to sin, and uh, that not without dishonoring these whom they believed to be gods. So he's saying, look, if these were all allegories, then why did they have to put allegories into these stories of sinful acts? It's almost like you're encouraging people to be sinful because uh, that's what the gods did. Wherefore, do not suppose that they are wise men, but rather evil spirits who could cover honorable actions with wicked stories in order that they should wish to imitate theirs better. Uh, their betters may emulate those these deeds of so-called gods which yesterday in my discourse I spoke so freely of, namely their parasites, uh, paraclides, parasides, their murders of their children, their incests of all kinds, their shameless adulteries and countless impurities. Uh, the most impious of them are those who wish these stories to be believed in order that they may not be ashamed when they go to do the like. If they have been disposed to act reverently, they ought, as I said, go... Uh, as I said a little ago, even if the gods really did the things which are sung of them, to have veiled their indecencies under more seemly stories, and not, on the contrary, as you say they did, when the, when the deeds of the gods were honorable, clothed them in wicked and indecent forms, which even when in, interrupted, even when interpreted, can only be understood by much labor, and when they were uh, understood by some, they indeed got for their much toil the privilege of not being deceived, which they might by some, which they, <laughs> and when they were understood by some, they indeed got for their much toil the privilege of not being deceived, which they might have had without the toil, while they who were deceived were utterly ruined. These, however, who trace the allegories to a more honorable source, I do not object to, as, for instance, those who explain one allegory by saying that it was uh, wisdom that sprang from the head of Zeus. On the other, or on the whole, 
it seems to be more probable that wicked men robbing the gods of their honor venture to promulgate these insulting stories. Nor do we find the poetical allegory about any of the gods consistent with itself. To go no further than the fashioning of the universe, the poets now say that the nature was first the cause of the whole creation, and now, it, and now that it was mind. For, say they, the first moving and mixture of the elements came from nature, but it was the foresight of the mind which ar arranged them in order. Even when they assert that it was nature which fashioned the universe, being unable absolutely to demonstrate this on account of the traces of design in the work, they enweave the foresight of mind of mind in such a way that they are able to entrap even the wisest. But we say to them, if the world arose from self-moved nature, how did it ever take proportion and shape which cannot come but from a superintending wisdom and can be comprehended only by knowledge which alone can trace such things? If, on the other hand, it is by wisdom that all things subsist, and maintain order, how can it be that those things arose from self-motivated, self-moved chance? So, again, it keeps coming back to this. It, it's like he is debating against evolution. I, I'm beginning to think that maybe evolution has its roots completely in paganism. Um, <clears throat> then those who chose to make dishonorable allegories of divine things, as, for instance, that Metis was devoured by Zeus, have fallen into a dilemma because they did not see that they who, ex who in these stories about the gods indirectly taught physics denied the very existence of the gods, revolving all kinds of gods into mere allegorical representations of the ver sub various substances of the universe. And so, it is more likely that the gods who these pe persons celebrate were some sort of wicked magicians who were in reality wicked men, but by magic assumed different shapes committed adulteries, and took away life. And thus, to the men of old, who did not understand, magic seemed to be gods by the very things they did. And the bodies and tombs of these men are to be seen in many towns. For instance, I have mentioned already, in the Caucasian mountains, there is shown the tomb of a certain Kronos, a man, and a fierce monarch who slew his children. And the son of this man, called Zeus, became worse than his father, and having, by the power of magic, been declared a ruler of the universe, he committed many adulteries and inflicted punishment on its father and uncles, and so died, and the Cretans show his tomb. And in Mesopotamia there lie beneath a certain Helios, uh, at a tear, and a certain Selene at uh, Carhe, a certain Hermes, a man, lies buried in Egypt, Ares and Thrace, Aphrodite and Cyprus, um, Asuphilus in Epidarius, and tombs of many other such persons are to be seen. So Clemens basically saying, look, these stories are just based upon humans who were magicians just like Simon Magus, not gods. Thus, to right-thinking men, it is clear that they were admitted to be mortals, and their contemporaries, knowing that they were mortal when they died, paid them no more heed, and it was length of time which clothed them with the glory of God. Nor need you to wonder uh, that they who um, lived in the time of Asuphius and Hercules were deceived, or the contemporaries of Dionysus or any other of the men of that time, when even Hector in Elim and Achilles in the island of Luce are worshipped by the inhabitants of those places and the uh, Opentines, Opentines worship Patrocluis and the Rhodesian Alexander of Macedon. Macedon. Moreover, among the Egyptians, even to the present day, a man is worshipped as a god before his death. And this truly is a small impiety that the Egyptians give divine honors to a man in his lifetime, but what is of all things most absurd, absurd is that they worship birds and creeping things and all kinds of beasts, for as the mass of men either think um, for the mass of men neither think nor do anything without with discretion. But look, I pray you, at what is most disgraceful of all, he who is with 
them, the Father of gods and men, is said by them to have had intercourse with Leda. And yes, I don't know if I'm pronouncing these names right. I'm okay with that, though. And many of them to set up in public a painting of this, writing above it the name Zeus, to punish this insult. I could wish that they would paint their own present king in such base embraces that they, as they have dared to do with Zeus, and set it up in public that from the anger of temporary monarch and him immortal they might learn to, do, learn to render honor where it is due. This I say to you, not as myself already, knowing that, knowing, not as myself already, knowing the true Elohim, but I am happy to say that even if I do not know who is Elohim, I think at least, uh, I think I at least know clearly what Elohim is. So he's basically saying, you know, if you think that, that Zeus is a god, some of the ways that these artists depict Zeus, you should be offended at that. You know, to think that he would, uh, that that people should uh, put forth these paintings of him doing these lewd acts or sexual acts or whatever. It says, and first, then the four original elements cannot be Elohim because they have a cause. Nor can that mixing be be Elohim, nor that compounding, nor that generating, nor the globe which surrounds the visible universe, nor the dregs which float together in Hades, nor the water which floats over them, nor the fiery substance, nor the air which extends uh, from it to our earth. For the four elements, if they lay outside one another, could not have been mixed together so as to generate animal life without some great artificer. For if they had have always been united, even in this cause, even in this case, they are fitted together by an artistic mind to what is requisite for the limbs or parts of animals, that they may be able to preserve their respective uh, proportions. Uh, may have a clearly defined shape, and that all the inward parts may attain fitting coherency. In the same way, also the positions suitable for each are determined, and uh, that very beautifully by the artificer's mind, uh, to be brief in all other things which a living creature must have, this great being of the world is in no respect wanting. Thus we are shut up to the supposition that there is an unbegotten artificer who brought the elements together if they were separate or if they were together artistically blended them so as to generate life and perfected them from all one work. For it cannot be that, uh, that a work which is completely wise can be made without a mind which is greater than it. Nor will it do to say that love is the artificer of all things or desire, or power, or any such thing. All these are liable to change and transient in their very nature, nor can that be Elohim which is moved by another, much less what is altered by time and nature and can be annihilated. While I was saying these things to Appion, Peter drew near from Caesarea and Tyre. The people were flocking together, hurrying to meet him and unite in expression of gratification at his visit. And Appion withdrew, accompanied by Anubian and Athenodorus only, but the rest of us hurried to meet Peter. Um, and I was the first to greet him at the gate. I led him toward the inn. When we arrived, we dismissed the people, and when he, dis and when he deigned to ask what had taken place, I concealed nothing but told him of Simon's slanderers and the monstrous shapes he had taken and all the diseases he had sent after the sacrificial feast, and that some of the sick persons were still there entire, while others had gone with Simon to Sidon just as I just as I arrived, hoping to be cured by him. But that I had heard that none of them had been cured by him. I also told Peter of the controversy I had with the Appion, and he from his love to me uh, and desiring to encourage me, praised and blessed me. Then having supped he betook himself to the rest, uh, uh, to the rest that the fatigues of his journey rendered so necessary. And that is the end of this homily. Um, like I said, it's a very short video. I knew we were more than halfway through the homily at the end of the last video, um, and yeah, you know, I just kind of breezed through it because there's not a whole lot to say other than I did have that observation about, um, you know evolution.
So so now he's back with Kifa. Once again, we're up to homily seven. Um, as I mentioned in the last video, I do have some doubts about the gen uh, the authenticity of this part of the homilies. Now, when we get back to homily ten, that's when we're we're back on track for sure. But we'll uh, we'll continue reading and we'll see what uh, homily seven, eight, and nine um, what they have to say because they may be genuine. You know, we we don't really know. Um, because these writings have been in existence for over a thousand years, and so we're, uh, they could all be authentic for all we know. Anyway, thanks for listening, and uh, join us next time, and we'll start on homily number seven. Shalom.